Hi, thanks for tuning in to the Faith Bridge Weekly Sermon Podcast. Let's listen now from an awesome Advent message from Pastor Dan Slagle called From Silence to Shouting. Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Bridge. So glad you're worshiping with us in this Christmas season. You know, one of my favorite things to do the beginning of the Christmas season, is to go back, open up my Bible, and reread the stories surrounding the birth of Jesus, primarily in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, just to reacquaint myself with those stories that I've read hundreds of times. It sort of helps get me in the Christmas spirit to be reminded of the arrival of Jesus, but also I never cease to be amazed at the inexhaustible truth to be found in God's Word. It doesn't matter how many times we read these stories, there's always something new to be found, something new to be drawn from God's Word. And sure enough, this year, as I was reading through the stories, I came across something that I had never noticed before. It wasn't anything particularly theologically profound, it's just something I'd never noticed before, and that is... There's a whole lot of talking going on around the birth of Jesus. I mean, somebody is constantly telling somebody else about the fact that Jesus is coming. You've got the angels who are telling all kinds of people. You've got wise men who are telling folks. You've got shepherds who are telling people. You've even got nasty old King Herod telling people because he's scared and worried about it. There's a lot of talking going on around the birth of Jesus. And yet right there in the middle of all that talking, rather conspicuously, is this one fellow who doesn't get to talk at all much. Because his ability to speak was taken from him. It's not that he came down with a bad case of laryngitis. No, in a a rather unusual, supernatural sort of way, his ability to speak was taken from him for nine months. Now, when he got the ability to speak again, words about Jesus came out like a torrent. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Why don't we do this? Let's take a minute and pray together. And then let's go to God's word and, and read about this fellow's story Together, We're going to be in the Gospel of Luke. That's the third book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. We're going to be in chapter 1. You can go ahead and turn there. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. Please accept that as a gift from us to you if you have need of a Bible. Luke chapter 1. We'll begin reading in just a moment in verse 5. Before we do that, though, let's, uh, let's take a minute and pray. Father, we are so grateful for the Christmas season, for the fact that you did not leave us in our brokenness, in our sin, in our rebellion, but you came after us. You chose to take on flesh and become one of us, walk among us, teach us, and then die for us having lived a perfectly sinless life and opening the possibility of eternal life to each one of us. We're grateful for that supreme Christmas gift. As we turn our attention now to your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come, be our teacher, and guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Reading in Luke chapter one at verse five. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years." Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. 
And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Look down to verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue was loosed and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days." So nine months of silence, and then bam, right away, he begins practically shouting about the birth of Jesus, from silence to shouting. You know, in that respect, I think many of us, when it comes to to talking about Jesus, can identify with Zechariah very, very well. Unfortunately, It's not the shouting part that we identify with, it's the silence that we tend to identify with. When it comes to talking about Jesus, remaining silent is just a whole lot easier than opening our mouths and saying something. And I understand, it can be awkward It's difficult for for anybody. I mean, just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean I don't find it difficult to talk about Jesus. You know, you go to a Christmas party. If you want to bring things to a screeching halt at a Christmas party, start talking about the Christ of Christmas. That's when folks are going to be making their way to the punch bowl or going to the restroom or something to get... Talking about Jesus 
can be challenging. It can be difficult. And sometimes, many times, I'm afraid for many of us, it's just easier to remain silent. Nevertheless, our Lord was so clear that he has every expectation we will not remain silent, that we will tell the world about him because we believe that he is the hope of the world, because we believe that he is the greatest gift that the world has ever received, because we believe that he has come to rescue us from our brokenness and our sin and that he has opened the doors of eternity for those of us who will choose to step into a relationship with him. We believe that. And so we have to hold in tension this cultural awkwardness we feel with the imperative, the command that Jesus gave us to talk about it. How are we going to do that? And how are we going to navigate that and do it winsomely and graciously and in such a way that we don't make enemies or at a minimum don't lose our friends along the way? Well, I think there are some things that we can learn from Zechariah about how to go from silent to shouting, or at least telling, if not shouting. Three things in particular that I noticed took place in the life of Zechariah during that nine-month period that I believe can happen in our lives as well and can equip and enable and empower us to share the good news of the gospel, the greatest news the world has ever heard. The first thing that I notice, oddly enough, has to do with that period of silence, that nine-month period of being unable to speak. Now, what was that all about anyway? You know, at first glance, it, it almost looks like he had the misfortune to encounter the grumpiest angel in the world. Oh, so, you're not buying it, huh? Well, how about this? Bap! You get to shut your big yapper for nine months. How's that working for you? The immediate cause of his inability to speak, of course, was his disbelief. But that wasn't the purpose. That wasn't the larger purpose. I think there was something much deeper going on here than simply a, a petty punishment, if you will. I think Zechariah needed, first of all, some time to be quiet. He was a busy man. He was a priest. He had responsibilities in the community. He was a husband. He was a leader in his community. And he's just discovered that he's going to be a father, something that he never, ever dreamed would happen. I'm sure his mind was going 90 to nothing. And probably the only thing he really wanted to think about or talk about was this child that would come, this boy that would be named John. But I think he needed some time to be quiet so that God could begin to help him see, uh, Zechariah, I need you to be thinking about some other things. I need you to be thinking about my priorities instead of your priorities. I need you to be thinking about the even greater gift that is to come, even beyond the gift of your son. I need you to be thinking about this Messiah that is coming to fulfill all of the prophecies and the promises of the Old Testament to rescue and deliver and redeem the people of Israel. That's what I need you to be thinking about. And I think in order to be thinking about that, he had to be quiet he needed some time for God to speak those truths into his heart. He needed some time to understand what kind of father he needed to be. Perhaps you picked up on it in the reading, but Zechariah would become, the birth of this son, the father of John the Baptist. Now, when he got the opportunity to speak, as we read... He doesn't talk about his son, first of all. Who does he talk about first? He talks about Jesus first. He talks about the Messiah first. Only later, if we had read on, do we see that he begins to talk about his son. Why, why that dynamic? 
It almost doesn't seem fair, but really it was a portent of things to come. Because what we know about John the Baptist was that his primary ministry was to point to Jesus. He even said of himself, don't don't look at me. Don't pay attention to me. I must become less so that he can become more. And so from the get-go, his own father was modeling for him, it's about Jesus first. Even over the most precious priorities of our lives, it's about Jesus first. If I know anything about Christmas, I know that Christmas is a busy, crazy season. We've got all kinds of things on our minds. We've got the shopping that we need to do. And there's baking that we need to do. And there's parties that we need to go to. And parties that we're hosting. And maybe we're traveling or maybe we're receiving travelers. And then that's on top of all of the regular things that could just continue to go in everyday life. And there's kids' activities as this semester begins to wind down. I mean, life is full to the brim. And I can't help but think that in the midst of all of this craziness and all of the craziness of our upside-down priorities, God isn't calling you and me to be quiet. Perhaps one of the reasons we are so reluctant to tell people about Jesus is because we haven't spent enough time thinking about him ourselves. You know, what's on our minds tends to come out of our mouths. And it's so easy to talk about the shopping and the baking and the parties and the so on and the so forth. Maybe it's not easy to talk about Jesus because we're not thinking about him very much. I have to think I truly believe that in this Christmas season, God is tapping each one of us on the shoulder and saying, I'd like for you to find some time to be quiet before me because there's some things I want to say to you. I've noticed over the years that God has a way of making divine appointments. He just sets up these opportunities for us to be able to tell somebody about Jesus But are we going to be ready when those opportunities come? Or is our mind going to be so filled with Christmas that we really don't have anything to say about Christ? God's not going to get you in a headlock. He's not going to chase you down and make you listen. He's going to wait And if you will respond, and if you will give him that time to speak into your heart, God will give you things that aren't for you. They'll be for somebody else. They won't be about your priorities. They'll be about his priorities, his priorities of Jesus and those who don't know Jesus. First thing we can learn from Zechariah when it comes to telling other people about Jesus is that first, we've got to be quiet. We've got to receive before we can give away. A second thing I notice about Zechariah also has to do with that period of silence. And I think it was during that nine-month period that he gained absolute confidence about what it was he was going to say. I think during that nine-month period, as he listened to God, as he spent time with God, as he was unable to talk about what he wanted to talk about, but listened to God, it was in that time that he became convinced, I've got the truth. I've got something to share. I've got something I must share. And when he does give me that gift of speech, that's what's coming out of my mouth. He had to be convinced deep down in his heart, deep down in his soul. And when that time came to speak, nobody had to coach him and nobody had to coax him. No, the gift came back and his mouth opened and out it came. Jesus, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Deliverer, the one who will rescue us. You ever been around anybody that was absolutely convinced about something? 
You ever been around anybody that trades in essential oils? Man, I tell you, those folks are convinced. I remember several years ago going on a mission trip to India. You know, if there is any place in this world where a Westerner has the potential to get sick, to pick up something, it's in India. It's just one of the hazards of going and serving God over there. All kind of crazy bugs and stuff. Not to mention on the flight over, you're in this airplane with people who are hacking and coughing. Well, on this particular trip, we're, we're seated there in the terminal waiting for our call to get on the airplane. And, and one of our team members, I notice, is, is going around. She's got this little vial, and, and she's putting a dot on everybody's head. And she gets to me, and she goes, here, put, put some of this on your forehead. I thought, are you like going to anoint us and pray over us? Is this anointing oil? She goes, no, 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 this is, this is called thieves. Thieves? What are, you, what are you talking about? She says, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, back in the Middle Ages, when the plague was killing everybody, these, these thieves would put this stuff on their forehead and they could go and steal everything in the home of a victim and they wouldn't get the plague. So if you put this on your forehead, you'll get to India healthy and you'll come home healthy. So you're telling me if I put a dot of this stuff on my head, I'm shielded from all viruses. No matter whose hand I shake or who coughs in my face or what kind of stuff I eat, I'm protected. Yeah. Hey, pour the whole bottle on my, I mean. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully you don't detect too much cynicism in my voice about all of this because once we got on the way, as we were flying over, you know, I was kind of chuckling to myself about the whole notion and how convinced she was. But in that moment, the Lord said to me, Dan, are you as convinced about me as she is about that oil? Are you really? If given the opportunity, could you speak up with the same fervor and enthusiasm and conviction? She didn't bat an eye telling you about that. Could you do the same for me? Sometimes I think our reluctance to talk about Jesus is because we haven't been quiet enough. We haven't listen to him enough, but sometimes I honestly think it's because we really deep down aren't convinced. I mean, we know the story. We're counting on getting to heaven. But convinced enough to talk about it? To actually tell somebody about Jesus? That can be a pretty good barometer, I think, of just how convinced we are. Is how enthusiastic we are about telling other people who don't know. There's a third thing we can learn from Zechariah. When he begins to speak, I notice that he speaks directly to the needs of his listeners of the people who were hearing him when he finally got his voice. Who was listening to him? First century Jews. And what was on the forefront of their minds? A Messiah. They had been looking for a Messiah to come for 800 years since the prophet Isaiah had foretold that he would come. And all during that time, they had been a conquered people. The Babylonians and the Persians, and now the Romans have them under their boot. And they're holding fast to this promise that this Messiah is coming. And so when Zechariah has an opportunity to speak, what does he speak into? He speaks into the Lord God who has come to redeem his people, who has raised up a horn of salvation for us, salvation from our enemies, 
to show mercy to our fathers, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies, to enable us to serve. They listened because he was speaking to what they were concerned about and what they were interested in. He had their attention because he understood them. Becky and I have a, a friend uh, who I am absolutely convinced has the spiritual gift of talking. <laughs> and years and years ago, uh, we, we had this individual over for dinner. And uh, afterwards, we made our way into the living room for some coffee. And uh, he, he began to hold forth on his favorite topic, which was himself. And man, he just talked on, is droning on and on. And, and I was doing my dead level best to just hang in there with him and, you know, listen, I've got training as a counselor, you know, so I'm, I'm but doggone it, the next thing I know, Becky is shaking me saying, wake up. <laughs> Despite my very best efforts, I had just... <laughs> she was not happy with me. Well, I apologized profusely, you know, and, and tried to make amends as, as best as, you know, boy, I've just been working so hard and... Uh, you know, I thought about it afterward. If he had, if he had just said one thing, just one thing that even remotely spoke into my life, I probably wouldn't have fallen asleep. I think sometimes um, folks are tuning us out because we don't know what they're struggling with. We don't know what their needs and their hurts are. We haven't taken the time to draw near enough to someone to discover what are your hurts, your hopes, and your dreams? What are the difficulties that you are living with? Here is how the gospel speaks in to that. Here is how the love of Jesus ministers to that. Here's the beautiful thing about the gospel, about the good news of Jesus. There is no human situation it does not speak to. As the creator of all of humanity, as the redeemer of all of humanity, Jesus speaks into every person's life. Do we know enough about what's going on in their lives to be able to speak to those do we care enough? Working at a church uh, can be rather antiseptic. No lack of time to be spent up here doing my job. But one of the hazards of that is the separation that comes between me and unbelievers. And so a while back, I, I felt like the Lord was saying to me, Dan, you've got to get out. You've got, you got to put yourself in a place where there are people who don't know me. Well, partially because I really needed it and partially because it seemed like a good place to go, I, I joined a gym. And what are you laughing about? <laughs> I had a really good point I was going to make about that. <laughs> now, it, it has been a delight over the last year to enter into the lives of men and women at that gym, many of whom who do not know him. And I, you know, I did not walk in there the first day, Bible in hand. <laughs> Let me tell you about Jesus. No. 
I went in there with my ears open and I do a lot less talking than listening because I really want to know what is going on in your life? Where are you hurting? What are your hopes and your dreams? Where are they falling short? Because I know God will, he has, and he will continue to provide these windows of opportunity for me to speak a winsome word. Just a word. And then another opportunity will come along to speak another word and another word. And I've experienced it many times in the past. Holy Spirit has a way of working in someone's heart where they eventually will come around to you. Because they've sensed that you care. They've sensed that you don't have an agenda other than loving them. And they'll begin to open their heart and practically roll out the red carpet for you to talk about Jesus. Do you have those opportunities in your life? Are, are you creating, are you looking for those opportunities? Are you letting people know that you genuinely care about them and what's going on in their lives? Christmas is a, a wonderful opportunity for us to tell other people about Jesus. It, it quite naturally lends itself to that. But we have to get ready. We, we, we have to be quiet for God to give us something to say. We, we have to have that deep conviction in our hearts that, yeah, we've got something to say, and then when we speak, we need to hit the bullseye. We need to speak into people's lives and not over and around them. And my challenge to you today as you leave here is to move from silence to shouting, so to speak. Now, I know some of you, uh, this kind of message for you, man, it's like red meat. You're like, yeah, I can't, I know exactly who I'm, you're out of here, ready to go. But then I know there are many others who, okay, I'm hearing this and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about it, I'm going to pray about it. My heart is open to it. Then I know there's this other group and you're sitting there right now just terrified at the thought of talking to somebody about Jesus. What on earth would I say? I don't know my Bible. I don't have all this theological training like you, Pastor Dan. It could just be a disaster. Well, I tell you what. The challenge for you is just to invite just invite somebody to come here on Christmas Eve. You know, Pastor Ken, he, he'll do the heavy lifting that night. He's got a powerful message about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you'll just invite somebody to come and hear it, he can take it from there. And that'll be a huge step in your life in moving from silence to shouting. As you leave today, these little discs are going to be at each exit. The thrill of hope. It's got the times and so forth on the back. Take one with you. Take a handful with you. And tell. And invite. It could make all the difference in the world in someone's life. Amen? Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, that you sent your son Jesus to come looking for us. We, we didn't have to look for him. We didn't have to beg you. We didn't have to perform for you. No, out of your immense love, you came looking. And you found us. 
and you have given us the gift of life in your son, Jesus. Lord, we carry this treasure with us, but we know you, you don't want us to hold on to it. You want us to give it away as it's been given to us. So by your grace, Lord, speak into our hearts with a word of encouragement. Give us that deep down conviction of the importance of the gospel. And then, Lord, open our eyes to the needs all around us so that we might speak a word of truth into someone's life. And we offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.